looking at kind of your resume and your, you know, your service to this, this county and everything thus far, you've been on the board for a couple of years. Why did you decide this was, this chair position was a position that you wanted to fill? Well, you know, this was a, um, uh, a position that um, is the, the board's decision. And um, I uh, was very clear um, that, you know, I, I wanted to uh, do whatever was the wish of our board team, because it's important that we work uh, as a team, especially in a, a critical time like this. And um, anyone who knows me knows that public education is in my bones. It's something about which I'm very passionate. Um, it's what drives me. Uh, both in my classroom as an, a teacher and uh, as a, a school board member. So uh, that's the type of passion and, and drive and energy that uh, I hope to bring to, to this position. And what for you are our priorities, our goals um, to, to accomplish during your term? Well, certainly uh, the most immediate uh, and pressing uh, consideration for our public schools and our community is uh, getting our uh, students and our staff back to in-person instruction as uh, soon and as safe as possible. I think that's a commitment that the entire board shares. It's a commitment um, that our administrative team shares. And I certainly hope it's a commitment that our community shares because it's truly gonna be a community effort. Um, so that transition is key. Uh, in Fayette County, we're also uh, undergoing a, another transition of uh, engaging in a superintendent search and selection process. So ensuring that we um, have an engaging and open and transparent process in terms of the search, uh, bringing in community partners and members and engaging them throughout that process, that's gonna be key to me. Uh, and then a uh, long term, um, that will be the central theme is uh, maintaining lines of clear communication and, and dialogue with uh, the community. I certainly don't want that to be a top down relationship. Uh, I want to find ways to engage our um, stakeholders, be they family members or staff members, um, students, uh, our community partners, because, you know, it, it sounds cliche, but it's true. It does take a village. Um, to raise a child. It takes a village to run a public uh, education system. So as a uh, board chair, I hope that I can help uh, facilitate those partnerships that are going to be required as we move forward. Following up on that, do you envision setting up a new, a, a different system, especially as we're in this virtual world, for that community engagement, those stakeholders, like you mentioned, even down to, to students? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're in, as a board team, we're in a number of conversations about, you know, how can we uh, fine tune and uh, work on communication uh, strategies and techniques. Uh, in some ways, um, the virtual environment that we've all become accustomed to has opened up new avenues of communication. So some of those things we may see continue uh, once we get past uh, the pandemic, uh, finding ways to engage folks, not just uh, in uh, in meetings, but making sure that that people have ways to access us and that people understand the process. Um, you know, sometimes when they look at school boards, uh, it, it may be op opaque to them um, what we do, but making sure that folks recognize um, that the work that we do is important, um, but we're, you know, we're not the be all end all. It's uh, sometimes I joke, it's this green lantern theory that folks think that the uh, school boards are like the green lantern, that if we just uh, will it strongly enough, then we can make it happen. It doesn't work that way. We, we have to build partnerships and uh, we have to engage in dialogue and we have to, um, we have to work together uh, to accomplish these tasks. And, always prioritizing the children we serve in the district. Okay, uh, just really quickly, uh, your relationship with Marlene Helm, how that's been going, um, give me just a, a quick piece on that. It's been very positive. Uh, you know, Dr. Helm is not a stranger to uh, Fayette County Public Schools. Um, she uh, came in at a very difficult time uh, for the district. Uh, she has um, handled this task uh, with a plum. And um, she and I have a very strong, effective working relationship. And, and I think that's key to uh, any successful uh, Board of Education is that, that strong dialogue and communication, uh, not just with the community, but also between the board and district administration. So uh, Dr. Helm is, is um, committed to communicating 
and establishing that dialogue. She, uh, again, is familiar with the district. Um, she, and she's committed and, uh, to, some, to many of these same goals. And did you know her prior to this position that you were in or not until she came up? Um, I knew of her. Um, I didn't know her personally, uh, but her uh, reputation uh, did precede her certainly in a, in a positive way. So um, I was um, uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to work with her um, and get to know her professionally and personally. Sure, sure. Well, how do you plan to hold her and the future superintendent, whoever it may be, accountable and ensure that the board and yourself don't become a rubber stamp? I know you were highly critical of the past relationship between the board and the district. Um, and I think that from conversations over time with you, that's, that was a mission of yours. How, how do you plan to actually make that happen? Mm -hmm. You know, it reminds me of a Winston Churchill quote of uh, if we engage in a quarrel between the past and the present, then then we risk missing out on the future. And so this board team is is um, is future focused and and looking at ways that we can uh, take whatever challenges our districts face and uh, make them opportunities. And then also building upon the legacy um, that has been left, because there are positive aspects. Um, uh, there are positive um, opportunities. There are opportunities for us to move forward as a district in terms of, uh, you know, as I say, communication and transparency of continuing the work of, of equity in our district. That's a priority that this board shares. And uh, recognizing, as I said, that this is, about, um, this is about building relationships and partnerships, not just, again, with community stakeholders, uh, but also with um, with the administration, with Dr. Helm and with whoever comes on board as um, the superintendent full time, uh, we want them to know that uh, they have a board team that is willing to uh, work with them uh, as you know, a working team uh, in, in partnership and uh, moving forward with the shared goal of ensuring that, that every child uh, receives a quality public education in Fayette County. And if we can focus on those shared goals and uh, work together in achieving them, then I think that we'll be very successful. But not afraid to challenge them, I guess, is, is you know, we hope that it can be one way, but not afraid to challenge them. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I mean, dialogue is uh, two way, you know, dialogue. Um, certainly when we say that we, we want it to be a conversation and, um, you know, the board does have an important role of, of um, oversight, the board, um, uh, but at the same time, the board can't be um, in all places at all times, right? So we have to rely on um, the work being done on the ground um, and, and trust um, that uh, the, the mission and goals of the district are being carried out. So uh, to me, as we uh, look ahead, I think that the relationship between the Board of Education and the administration uh, needs to be centered upon two uh, main priorities. And the first is dialogue, as I said, that uh, two-way dialogue. And then uh, the second is, is trust, um, a, a collaborative, trusting environment um, where we work together to achieve those shared goals. And I, and I think that's a commitment our whole board team shares. Okay. Some concerns have been brought to my attention about anyone's ability to be holding a full-time job teaching other students and also be holding this role in a different county. Um, what do you say to those naysayers and those people who are skeptical um, about how you're going to be able to balance it? Or do you have any, any plans to maybe put a year or two of teaching on hold? Um, can you address that concern? Well, you know, I think that we are uh, in a very, <clears throat> Uh, this is a very strong board team. We have over 60 years of combined educational experience on our team. Um, I, I don't know if we've ever had a, a sitting and active classroom teacher as, as board chair. So I think that's insight that's actually um, an asset to the board. And uh, we, again, have a, a, a team where it can't be uh, just me, right? I'm, I'm going to need help from our board members and from our community. Uh, and that's how it should be anyway. Um, you know, we talk about boards of education and we talk about making sure that we open up access and opportunities and encourage folks to become engaged in the process. Uh, boards of education are 
not designed in Kentucky, certainly to be uh, full-time positions. So, you know, we need to look at <clears throat> how can we uh, not only uh, use the talents and the assets that we have on our board team, but how can we engage in outreach um, to the community at large to make uh, boards of education uh, an attractive uh, position for folks, right? To, to help build the bench and, and, and recruit, uh, recruit diverse uh, candidates who may be interested in, in leading the district in the future. Because, you know, it, it's, that's something that we as a board team are thinking about. We're future um, we're future thinking uh, in that regard. So, you know, we, we don't want to establish barriers to any position uh, when it comes to engaging the community uh, with our school district. So we're about, you know, breaking barriers of access and, and, you know, making positions like this something that people in the community, if they see, okay, I have something to contribute, I can make a difference, um, then it's, it's something that they pursue. Um, so that's going to be one of the things that, that I will, um, will focus on and look at moving forward of uh, establishing that balance and um, building those relationships so that I can trust that um, the, the work is being done and it's being done in partnership and it, it doesn't all fall on, on a single board member's um, shoulders. And, and that's how we're going to be successful, I feel. In that same vein, there's been some criticism about, and I'm sure you've heard it, teaching in a county that has done some in-person days and keep being here in a county where there's an argument on all sides about what to do with school. How, um, just what do you say to those people who are saying, this is highly hypocritical. How can he not be forging this path ahead faster? And I don't know if that's, if that's pointing, I'll, I'll let you answer. Well, I will say one, you know, we have to be careful with an apples and oranges comparison, right? Um, you know, the district where I teach is uh, significantly uh, smaller and has fewer logistical hurdles to contend with than, um, than Fayette County Public Schools, uh, number one. Number two, I'm not in, uh, involved as a school board member in the county where I, te I teach. So th those decisions uh, generally are above my uh, pay grade. So certainly, I mean, they, they do ask for, for staff input and we do have those conversations. And uh, my position as a classroom educator does lend me some insight in my conversations with administrators in Fayette County Public Schools. Um, so it's, it's not a situation where, well, uh, you know, Tyler Murphy is saying that it's safe to go to school in Boyle County, but it's not safe to go to school in Fayette County. Uh, it's a, uh, this is a complex uh, situation. Um, it's, it's not just uh, data and the data is part of it, but it's also multiple considerations. And we have an administrative team in Fayette County um, that is working uh, each week in concert and in conversation with uh, local public health officials who are responding to the needs uh, and the healthcare realities in our community. In Boyle County, we have an administrative team that is working in concert with public health, health officials there, uh, responding to the realities uh, of the community. So, you know, that's the thing with, with the situation we find ourselves in, is these uh, uh, public health matters are very much community specific and community driven. So all of the, the uh, data and the research and so forth has to be contextualized in, uh, with the community um, that we're dealing with and the other factors that go into to educating um, our students. Okay. You, uh, you entered this role during a time that this, this district really is in a bit of a crisis with you know, teachers disagreeing with each other on what to do, parents disagreeing, students, some of which failing classes they maybe never would have failed, a superintendent suddenly passing away. There's a lot of fear, there's a lot of anxiety from all of those parties, I think, that I, at least that I've spoken to. How do you plan to take that temperature down and progress forward? You, you mentioned getting students back in the classroom as a goal. How immediate um, can some of these things be addressed? I, as I mentioned earlier, whenever there are challenges, um, there are also opportunities. And this has been traumatic uh, for everybody. Uh, again, not just the um, not just the pandemic, but also you know the the 
crises going around uh, across the nation that, that personally uh, impacts uh, our students, especially in a, in a district that is uh, majority minority. Uh, the, as you mentioned, the, the sudden death of a superintendent. Um, all of these are traumatic uh, experiences. And what they also remind us is the important and pivotal and critical role that our public schools play in the lives of our children and in the life of our community. And if anything, I hope that this whole experience um, has underscored that fact and reminded our community that it has to be a partnership, that our public schools do not exist in a, vac a vacuum. Um, they reflect uh, the realities, uh, both good and bad, often, of our uh, communities. So the question that we need to ask ourselves is how can we take these challenges uh, and turn them into opportunities and continue the work that needs to be done? Because at the end of the day, I still have faith and, and belief in our public schools uh, because we have talented uh, educators working on the ground every day uh, to make what seems impossible possible. Uh, we have students that are doing the best they can in the face of extraordinary circumstances and odds while trying to grapple with the realities of the world around them and make sense of things that really even adults can't even make sense of right now. So again, it is multifaceted, it is complex, and we want folks to understand that, that we're aware of that complexity. We're, we're not ignoring those issues. We recognize them. But at the same time, solutions uh, cannot be just top down. They're going to require partnership. They're going to require collaboration. Um, getting our kids back in school, uh, that's going to require community effort when it comes to mitigation, uh, when it comes to you know, making choices about how, what can we do together um, to reduce community spread uh, and, and create a public health environment where it is safe uh, to move forward. And then moving forward, wh what can we do uh, to uh, encourage our um, legislators to, to prioritize getting shots in the arms of teachers, to have a, a coordinated national strategy um, to make sure that, that public schools are supported, um, that our educators uh, have a safe environment uh, in which to work. That can't be a board chair or a school board acting by themselves. So I implore anybody who, who, who shares that uh, concern and that desire to, to get us back on stable footing is engage in the process and uh, encourage everyone else to engage as well and to make public schools a priority. We can't only pay attention to public education when we're upset with it. Uh, we ha it's an ongoing process and we have to be engaged with it. So as we move out of this pandemic, one of the uh, areas that this board is going to be looking at is how can we keep um, the community productively engaged in public education so that, you know, the motivation to contact us just as, isn't out of frustration or just isn't out of upset, but, but it's in partnership. And especially as you guys are using this matrix to make decisions on when students will return to the classroom, it seems like that is kind of the, the bar that you guys are, the threshold of what you all are, are using right now. Correct me if there's some other thing I need to be thinking about here. Um, but can the district be working with the health department on this COVID-19 percentage rate and take out numbers like those that are, that we've seen lots of clusters in jails, or we've seen obviously lots of clusters in nursing homes. Are, they, are these conversations that have been had and things that have been looked at to, you know, obviously we're in this big county that's had these clusters, could those numbers be removed for, for the numbers that people would say are more at risk for students? Yeah, that's a, a good question. And I think uh, some of the uh, misunderstanding about the matrix is the matrix is not just um, the numbers. So that's one part of it, right? That's the, vi the visual part of it, which is why most folks will pay attention to that. Um, but it, we look beyond the numbers. So the, and again, these are administrative decisions because the board, uh, the board has asked the administration to have a ongoing dialogue with pub local public health officials and then you know, communicate 
um, the results of that of that dialogue. And, and, and those um, conversations have been ongoing and they happen at least uh, once a week. So in addition to looking at the, uh, the data, these leaders in the district are talking with public health officials. They're looking at things like you know, uh, recommendations from uh, the Department of Public Health at the state level, um, uh, student and staff uh, incident uh, rates, um, isolations and quarantines, uh, considerations for operation, operations and support, um, community versus institutional spread to, to your point about, you know, our, our uh, numbers just reflecting an outbreak in an isolated area. So that, that's factored in. Um, community trends. And then, of course, uh, once we get to the point of the vaccine, uh, the uptake of the vaccine will be another consideration. So yeah, it's important to emphasize to folks that this is not just a, okay, this is the number for this week, this is our decision. It's okay, this is the number for this week. What does that mean? What can we learn from it? And so uh, those conversations are happening with district administrators and again, the folks on the ground, because you know that's why, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the the board can't be everywhere at the same time, right? So we have to rely on the folks on the ground who uh, know what it's going to take to get back to school, um, who are engaged in conversations with the public health experts um, to evaluate this information, and then and then make those decisions in their appropriate context. So, so yeah, we have the matrix, uh, but it's important for the community to understand the matrix is one part of the equation. Okay, and you mentioned those people on the ground who are helping make that decision. Who just, can you list like uh, types of people that those, are, the, the, those people are, positions that they hold? Yeah, so of course, uh, Dr. Helm, the acting superintendent, uh, we have folks from our district um, health team, our district uh, um, health administrators, we have um, communications folks on there. We have operations and transportation folks on there. We have school um, administrators um, and school chiefs who um, are in uh, conversation with our, our principals and the principals are in conversation with their uh, educators. Um, so we, we wanna make sure we have as many special education staff on there as well. So we have as many um, voices at the table who can allow us to look at again, it's multifaceted, so allowing us to look at the multiple facets um, that would be involved in any decision to return uh, to in-person instruction. Okay. Two more quick questions. I know you, you're going to have to go here for class. Um, I'm hearing, you know, story after story of teachers appearing on screen right now for just a few minutes, not the full class period, um, and parents raising concerns, students raising concerns. I don't think I'm going to you know, I don't think I'm gonna pass this class. And this is a class I never would have failed. Um, what are plans in place to help students who are, are going to be falling behind? Will there be summer offerings to make up for lost time? Is this a conversation the board is having and how can we make this a reality for people who need help this summer? Yes, and this is actually something that came up at our uh, last board meeting. Uh, it is something that the board has, uh, has asked about. And it is something that our, um, again, our administration uh, is uh, considering. You know, we have um, an academic uh, services uh, team uh, that is assessing, you know, what is, what's going to be the, the impact? And then how can we, once we get back to uh, uh, in-person learning, how can we address um, the uh, transition from remote instruction to in-person instruction. So those conversations are ongoing. Uh, one of the things that I've encouraged uh, and will continue to encourage is, again, engaging our experts in the district, which are educators, uh, in those conversations. And um, you know, working in partnership, again, with our, our families and our communities to see what our options might be. So uh, we have a number of options. Much of it will depend on, on, on how the next few uh, weeks unfold in terms of, of community transmission of COVID-19 and what the timeline looks like. But uh, that is absolutely a priority for um, the district uh, moving forward. And, and that transition, that post-COVID transition is going to be key and it's going to be something that this uh, board team uh, will support in facilitating. And it, it may not even be post-COVID, it could be amid-COVID, right? Okay. Exactly, yeah. Okay, 
And just last question before I know you have to go, you know, you voted this week on the budget at the board meeting and um, I receiving questions from both parents and teachers wondering why several million dollars are being spent on the virtual learning academy and um, when it serves such a small population of students. So my question to you, was this a matter of contract fulfillment to have to, to continue with this or do you think that VLA is a good use of the district's money? Well, um, just to clarify, we didn't vote on the budget. So, so we're the part of the budget process is um, an initial review, kind of like our, our budget staff says, okay, these are kind of the things that we've penciled in. And then we have a draft budget uh, will come up later in May. Um, so that was included on a um, PowerPoint slide as part of the meeting. And I know it, it uh, attracted a lot of attention. And, and if you listen closely in the meeting, um, they mentioned that this was if we had to continue, right? So, so if we're in a situation where uh, we would have to continue some virtual learning options into uh, next school year, that would be a conversation, right? So there wasn't a vote that hasn't, the contract hasn't been renewed. Um, those would be conversations that we would have to have as a board team. Um, at, at this juncture, I don't have enough information to, to say one way or the other. I, I do think that we would have to discuss those questions that you raise. I think that uh, the board would need to see some information um, about uh, the program and about what our options might be. But of course, uh, we, we, it's hard to predict where we will be next month, let alone next fall. So um, that hopefully that helps clarify that situation. There was no decision made at the board meeting about a VLA for next year or about the budget. That was just a kind of just in case we've we've set set uh, we've factored these funds in. Very good. Very good. Okay. Okay. And I guess just how do you you know you're talking about new lines of communication. It sounds like maybe that's just still in the works. So for now, what is the best way for any stakeholders to get in touch with you with the board? What do you suggest? Mm -hmm. uh, well, you know, uh, my email uh, is. Um, uh, probably the quickest uh, way to get a hold of me is just tyler.murphy at fayette.kyschools.us. Um, you also have a way to um, email the entire board using feedback at fayette.kyschools.us. Um, and as we get into, especially with the superintendent search process, we'll look at some ways to kind of uh, create some online forms and make some of that feedback uh, a little more user friendly. Um, so it's, it's not just in the in form of an email and we're in those conversations. Uh, but again, uh, we are uh, a district that um, uh, is committed to the success of every child. Uh, we're committed to engaging stakeholders uh, from educators to family members to community partners and everyone in between. Um, so, so I'm always uh, willing and, and uh, able to have a conversation with anybody. And I would encourage folks uh, to work with us in partnership uh, because uh, moving forward and the success of this district uh, is going to mean uh, engaging our community in that process. Public education must be a shared endeavor. And I hope um, that it will be everyone's priority as we move forward. 